I shall now pass the floor to Ambassador C to introduce the panelists and chair this session. Ambassador C, please.
fact is that they were able to articulate through a own struggle for independence the notion of self-determination for themselves as well as for other colonial peoples. So the first joint action between India and China was the articulation of the principle of self-determination that brought freedom to the peoples of Africa and Asia. Thereafter, they initiated a process of decolonization for the, the states that are still subject to imperial control of the European powers. So that first phase of action towards meeting power with norms of justice, the norm that a people should not be under control of other people, is an assertion of a right in terms of international law, the assertion of the notion of self-determination. Then came the Cold War, and again we find China and India acting together in order to assert the rights that they had won after their prolonged freedom struggles. We find both countries articulating that there should be a new international economic order. The move towards the notion of a new international economic order took place largely in the context of activity in the General Assembly of the United Nations. This activity then was a joint activity that was aimed at bringing about structural changes to the international economy. The assertion of the notion of permanent sovereignty over natural resources required that every state and every people should have the right of control over their natural resources and that these natural resources should not be utilized in such a manner as to serve the interests of the previous colonial states of Europe and the United States. So here again we see the notion of an articulation of the doctrine of international law which passed into the constitutions of the newly liberated countries of Asia and Africa. The idea that the natural resources of the state must belong to that state and should not be exploited in order to serve the interests of other people in faraway states. The new international economic order had other features. The payment of just prices for commodities, the access of manufactured goods of uh, originating in developing countries to markets in the Western world. So that phase of the new international economic order, again, is a phase in which China and India cooperated quite actively. So there were two early phases then, in which these two countries had met the power-based international law generated in Europe with the argument that there must be a justice-based order that is brought about through the joint action of India and China and the rest of the developing world. The third phase is the phase after the Cold War, when we find the emergence of the United States as the sole hegemonic power. And this probably lasted from the fall of the Soviet Union until perhaps now. And in this 20 year period, we find international law being remade in order to fit a uh, world order as conceived by the United States. Here we see a massive uh, effort on the part of the United States to restructure international law in such a manner as to ensure the pursuit of its own ideologies of democracy and a free market. And we see in the free market, the idea of the philosophy of the free market, the establishment of legal institutions like the World Trade Organization, uh, 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 multitude of investment agreements and free trade agreements that ensure that the free market philosophy takes hold tally on, on a global scale. Here again then, the idea simply is that the law must be restructured in order to ensure the prevalence of the right to property, the liberalization of flows of assets, the uh, freedom of trade, and the idea that multinational companies 
have, should have the right of establishment in the developing countries of the world. So this was the economic model that the United States advocated for the world and Asia that it brought about through the instrumentality of international law and the principles it enunciated. For example, the document on intellectual property that is attached to the WTO ensured that copyright patents and other intellectual property are given absolute protection. An idea that sits uncomfortably with the dangers of developing countries because the patenting of drugs would impose a heavy burden on the health costs of poorer countries of the world. So here in the first uh, uh, 10 years or so of uh, the hegemonic order that the United States sought to establish, there was a heavy reliance on the neoliberal economics. Being the impetus that was given to the establishment of a global order based upon the philosophy of the free market. A free market and its invisible hand cannot function without a male fist backing it. And so we find the international law related to the use of force also being changed by the United States. We find, for example, the argument made that uh, if a people are being, uh, being massacred in a country like Kosovo, the United States should have a right to intervene in order to prevent such massacres. We find uh, the United States leading the NATO invasion in, uh, in uh, that region on the basis that humanitarian intervention justified such a mission. We find the articulation of similar ideas, the ideas of protecting democracy being used in order to invade Iraq and to ensure a regime change in India. So what one can see here is that both on uh, the economic front as well as on uh, the political front, changes have been brought about in uh, the international law that existed in order to cater to the interests of the United States. It was very much an order that was driven to, uh, driven by the pursuit of the national interests of the United States. The United States had a real vision to ensure that it changed the order in such a manner as would ensure the dominance of the philosophies of uh, neoliberalism and neoconservatism to take hold on a global scale. Now, of course, we have the, a third phase of reaction on the part of India and China. Unlike in the past, of course, India and China are now emerging states. And possibly as a result of its uh, extension, overreach of imperial power, the United States, though still the most dominant state, has lost some of its hold on international relations. So at this juncture, the emergence of uh, the, uh, the uh, of India and China and a possible reduction in the power of the United States, one can see the emergence of a multipolar world and one can assume that the two rising states of India and China will play a dominant role in the shaping of the international law of this world in the sense that uh, they having become basis of power themselves will be able to make dents on the law that has so far been structured by the United States. So the romantic vision that one would have of this situation is that China and India would cooperate in order to ensure that the hegemonic order that has been so far established will be changed. We first find, of course, the fact that the two countries are ancient countries driven by ethical attitudes towards the world. From the time of Asoka, through Gandhi, one would find, to, to Nehru, one would find that ethical visions dominate the foreign policy of India. Then one finds that in other areas, like the Doha Development Round, India and China cooperate. On climate change, the attitude towards the Kyoto Protocol, there is again concerted action that is brought about. But most importantly, in the context of BRICS, one finds that the two countries 
are driven not only by an economic rationale but also by a political rationale. If one, if one reads the Delhi Declaration of after the BRICS meeting, one would see the two countries, along with uh, its partners, Russia, South Africa, and Brazil, taking stances on almost every aspect of uh, the problems of the world today. On Libya, it advocates that there should be, should not have been an intervention. It advocates that there should be no intervention in Syria except under the auspices of the United Nations. So there is a common stance that is taken. But of course there is a radical theory, which I would refer to as the realist uh, notion. There are of course going to be conflicts between India and China. The border war was spoken of. There is uh, the possibility that uh, on the South China Sea, India is going to be a player in that it, uh, it, uh, it, would, uh, uh, it, it would be a strong supporter of freedom of navigation which it might deny to China in its own Indian lake, the Indian Ocean. So here there is obviously a potential for conflict. And the realist vision would emphasize the, the, the aspects of the conflicts that could arise between India and China. But let me end by saying that the most realist vision is for both countries would be that they should ensure that international law is based on the ethical foundations which the cultural roots of both countries would insist on, on, uh, on as uh, the basis of the world order. And it is the return to these ethical foundations that both the culture as well as the political interests of these two countries dictate that one would find the future of the multipolar world established. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Professor Sonaraja, for giving us a comprehensive history of the evolution of the legal order, starting from the colonial times to the present. I recall that in the 1950s, we had the so called financial principles between China and India. I'm not sure whether this principles are still to build nowadays the new five of these two countries. Next. I have a pleasure to invite Professor Watson now. He is a professor of international relations in the International uh, School of Law in the Shanghai Issue of Foreign Trade. He will speak from the Chinese perspective of India China global and regional cooperation. So, Thank you for Chairman Sun. Uh, also, I appreciate uh, the invitation of the uh, ISS. ISS invitation to be here and it's honorable. It's a great, uh, wonderful conference. I think you know about the China, US, China, Japan. <laughs> China, Indian uh, coverage. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm a professor of international studies. So that's why I always find a great power relations here. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I think it's a very good topic. You know, when I uh, got a suggestion from Professor uh, Palatz, a uh, suggestion of to talk about China uh, Indian uh, cooperation uh, globally and uh, regionally, uh, the whole China and India uh, see our future together when we face, we face so many changes. That's why I choose the topic China, you know, uh, the, the regional global cooperation between China and India is from a Chinese perspective. Uh, first of all, let me uh, introduce a little bit about my idea. It's a Chinese professor about the international and regional order. I uh, always see uh, the, the Chinese international environment has been changing. Uh, I will talk about first the, the U.S. geopolitical offensive in China, but I do not mean the military. We will have a military war with the United States. The United States want, want to have a war with China. I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about the U.S. military and political economic, all these kind of people have pressure on China, against the China. Want to, there are many Chinese cities that just want to contain China. But from my point of view, it's, I think it's just one intention that make Chinese, uh, you know, in China going down, that cannot be of competition to the United States. I think that many Chinese, you know, accept my view. So, 
Uh, but let's talk about the U.S. government offensive against China. We see that the, the, you know the last case uh, of the uh, you know uh, Eurasian continent that from the west to the east, how did they Obama shift some the foreign uh, strategy from the Middle East, from the west to the east, then return to China to Asia strategy from the you know, how is the mix of the hot pot spots like around China. You know, we can see that from the beginning of the you know, era that of spring uh, uh, in the Middle East, from Libya to Egypt, and also now from Syria, Syria, and uh, you know other you know, uh, you know Middle East Arab countries. But also, also from to the the hot uh, the hot spot to Asia Pacific to uh, to, to uh, the places near you know, around China, like uh, we have the uh, particularly in the last two years we have the very spot spots in South China Sea, in East China Sea, in, 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 in even in North East, uh, you know, uh, Asian region, like in um, Korean Peninsula. All these uh, you know, crises happen around China, in Chinese people, as it is not happen, it can never happen without the American return to Asia. So this is, we can handle ourselves. We, we can handle this problem with, uh, with Asian countries, with uh, uh, Japan, with South Korea, with all kinds of by themselves, without the American return to Asia. This, I think, is a common understanding of Chinese people. So you can see, uh, also we uh, talk about the military, uh, how Chinese, as Professor uh, earlier, you know, Mr. Wu mentioned that so China needs military uh, capability to protect our sea lanes, so energy transportation, we need more uh, power to protect our own national interests. But this is natural from other countries, but so how we deal with the new problems. This is also Chinese facing, but also for other Asian countries we are, uh, and also for, you, for India. But Chinese also thinks that, you know, uh, what I call the strategic defense posture in the last several years. Uh, first, we can see that the China and Russia strategic mutual trust has been creating, you know, projects very Good role in, in China Russian relations in the Asia Pacific. Uh, why, you know, what is why the Japan Russia uh, territory disputes also erupted? We can see all the ways some hints or some, you know, we the common sense between China and Russia. I don't want to talk about China and Russia relations, but I may want to mention that because thanks to the China and Russia uh, strategy in mutual trust, so that's why we can maintain a relatively stable South, you know, uh, East Asia in this region. Also, we can benefit from the, from this mutual trust. And also, China is taking the non-first policy of changing the goal of the internal disputes with our neighbors. That is, China in the last year, for example, the disputes with Philippines, the disputes with uh, Japan, all these kind of disputes we never, you know, uh, in, the that we had you know do by China at first. All is China have to defend. So this is China policy posture. As China has been handling uh, you know doing this posture, we can keep this policy future for many for 30 years when China uh, opened the door in the 1980s. So this is in the other Chinese diplomatic principle that the Tao Yang Wei and then use of the way the claim is wrong. And uh, also we can uh, when China is facing that the probability countries, you know, the further actions from Philippines to Japan, uh, which Chinese uh, government is doing sticks and carrots. It's not doing the similar as we did three years ago when we have the conflicts with the United States over Taiwan Island with the others, which China always take uh, you know, gas at, at the sticks from the United States and China keep quite soft, just the heroic reactions and taking no other end. But that's why the China is changing and China is doing more useful the way. It's not only talking about it more. So that's the China policy is changing, but it is the, the, the strategic defense posture is still doing the same as talking about it first and then and see somewhere, sometimes you know, some cases it's useful the way. So this is uh, 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 ch China's policy uh, changes. Another, the Chinese regional uh, uh, taking uh, the regional stability and uh, integration economically uh, is still the first priority from Chinese policy, foreign policy agenda. Uh, in the, in the, under the framework of 10 plus 1, 10 plus 3, 
or China, Japan, South Korea, the triangle economic uh, free trade role and talks, you know, all the China, even we have a, such a serious crisis with Japan, with Philippines, China is doing the same, it's still the same, that China wants to encourage the regional integration, regional economic uh, cooperation, because it's not only benefit to China, but also benefit to all the big countries in this region. China also share, uh, with, uh, share a multiple war with our neighbors. Uh, with such, as, such as, you know, as in Japan, uh, uh, India, uh, South Korea, ASEAN, you know, we, we, I think many countries in you know, Asia uh, share this view. The China wants a multiple walls uh, under the, you know, the BRIC and G20 framework. Third, I want to talk about you know, mutual trust, a mis mistrust and, and uh, misunderstanding growing among Asian countries. Uh, I want to talk I don't want to talk more, because everybody, I think, knows this, if you have that understanding, you have the feeling that China and China, the US relations, China, Japan, China, Philippines, China, India, uh, even South Korea, Japan, uh, Russia, Japan. All these know it has bad relations, you can find the mistrust, the misunderstanding you can find in you know, between the countries. The problem is uh, the mutual, mistrust, you know, the mutual mistrust, misunderstanding can encourage the misconcept, you know, calculation, uh, really miscalculations, and also the crisis we have. We can see clearly the miscalculation from Japan. The strategic misunderstanding of China, Chinese power, and Chinese government's reaction to the Dalian Islands. So this makes the Japan seem such a strong, but it's wrong policy toward China or the Dalian Islands. Now we have a crisis. Still we are in this crisis. So that's the fancy the miscalculation. It's from the mistrust and misunderstanding. We should have more exchanges in the China and China neighbors. And also another uh, factor in this international and regional order is, is the factor of the danger of taking size pressure from the shift of American spread firms. We can see it here, we talk about the ASEAN, we talk we are in Singapore, we talk about the ASEAN, we just think you know, know that. The, the meeting of ASEAN plus 10, uh, plus 3, and ASEAN at the East Asian Summit. You can see that ASEAN, country, ASEAN is still in a, in a very difficult position. That ASEAN takes the size of the United States, or China will take the size of the United States of China. So it's a very difficult moment. So yeah, there's the problem that the American ships of strategic focus uh, makes all the countries in this region in a difficult position. You have to choose. But the problem is when you choose, you have to choose China or choose United States. That means you have to have been or something or really have been lost aligned with somebody else. That means we are in a difficult position more and more. So that this integration, uh, we can see that the voice, different voice in Asian countries, you know, in this countries, in this Asian summits. That's the issue, that's the factor is taking uh, you know a problem. So that there are also others. And also China, uh, uh, you know, in Australia, other than East Asian countries, also in the same thing that they made the policy alternatives. Okay. So more countries think size, more mistrust. I think that's why we are here, we're talking about, we're not, I remember this morning, President, uh, you know, Mr. Wu mentioned that we, the US, the India cannot be used by the United States as a fact, you know, pressure against China to contain China. This is one view that we are worrying about this. We are worrying about if we choose a side, there's a problem for all of us. Okay, next slide, you know, to be triggered, because I only have five minutes. China and India cooperation is a way for Asia's you know, stability and productivity. I'm looking for that this is the, now, this is a multipolar world. The US is rebalancing to Asia Pacific. And the Chinese want to call for a kicking of world balance. It means this is a this is this is a very difficult situation, guys. This is not from China Chinese view. This is not multiple polarity laws. But from the United States, they want to keep a sort of you know, the, the universal law. So this, this is a problem. Uh, Asia economic development and Asia uh, rights that uh, cannot survive also you know, without uh, India and China cooperation. Uh, China and, in, and India, we want to, I think, uh, both sides, want to keep a new balance of the world. 
but it's difficult because we, we have a China and India share similarities, not only culturally, but also economic developments, the climate changes, environmental protections, and other non-traditional issues, as a threat from China. So the China cannot cry, you know, cannot cry without cooperation with our neighbor, particularly India and the uh, you know, West Monster, and also Russia countries, of course. Uh, this is you know, um, you know, according to the IM calculation of the GDP or PPT uh, calculation that China and India now is moving forward in the next 20 years, in, uh, uh, I think we in the four, top 10. And, and Japan and, and, and India also in the, will be according to the PPT, uh, India will be in the you know, top, ten, top four. So you can see China and India, if we want to survive, we want to keep going on the growth. I think that's important for both China and India to cooperate. How is to you know country work together on multilateral uh, platform? And first thing is the agenda should have been, we should you know uh, know the mistrust of each other, especially the intention. I don't want to learn a little bit uh, to more about uh, the Chinese view, but also we talk about some you know China understanding of the uh, you know Indian view. The chief Indian view is that China wants to contain. India to go on. So this is a misunderstanding from Chinese perspective. So we still have this uh, mistrust between each other. But we have to find a way uh, to build companies and you know, building measures. Uh, just you know, several years ago, uh, later we have, we have the uh, second China India SED uh, talking in New Delhi, I remember. And China uh, India also have a constant service average about the world. This is a uh, basis. For China and Japan, India, uh, we have many views. You know, on um, U.S. setting a model of uh, for walls. Uh, for example, on um, Central Asia stability, the BRICS uh, forum uh, framework on um, climate changes and WTO, and also we also impose any foreign attempt to subserve, uh, support the legitimate governments of any other countries. That's why we have shared this position of a several crisis. Uh, and also we share the, the idea of reform of international financial institutions to deal with the international crisis, okay, you know, crisis. Okay, last minute I want to talk about the China the foreign policy implications. First thing, uh, we have to find new uh, diplomatic principles first to solve the bilateral problems through improving regional and economic and security cooperation. And second, to promote a peaceful Transformation of world order through strengthening of cooperation in inter international financial and, and trade institutions. And third, I think this is uh, for both countries to establish more, not only the SED, but also to practice more bilateral CDMs. So, how we choose? I'd like to just uh, give several recommendations. First, uh, beyond talks of the exchange of over bilateral economic topic, that's the SED, it's a big talk, uh, you know, uh, talk now. And also the dialogue on international economic and financial reform under the SED weekend as well. We should expand the topics. And also the dialogue on South Asian regional economic integration, including China. Geographically, China is also a South Asian country. So under the SED in Canada, we can also expand the talk on China is one of the member. And third, China India strategy is pretty down. I think we, we need to do more not in our economic view, but also security. Field. For example, we talk about the, the, the Indian permanent seat as the, the U.S. Security Council, and also we know the border disputes, and also multiple aspects of coin national interests, uh, the Indian Pakistan relations, and also for example like the ASEAN role in China Indian security uh, considerations. All these you know, should be, we really should expand our land, our you know idea of how we build trust. This is one. But the third plus one is energy security. China needs more military power to protect ourselves or civilians, but also India to have the same problem. So we how we we know we do trust we will do trust between us. This is what I talk. Thank you very much.
relations are China and India will have a large space uh, for building uh, CBMs. Uh, since which China and India first is uh, psychologically, is I think it's easier to communicate. As I always you know, talk to my Indian friends, yeah, so it's easier to understand each other because we are have to share a similar history. Uh, since we can understand each other easily, we the Indian professor can understand the Indian uh, people can understand why China opened our door. Uh, we share we, we have the law. China is a model for our uh, Indian developments. We can even see peer voices. We China China have a lot for India to learn. But on the other hand, we can find that when we talk about the Indian-China relations, we still also China share a view that India is doing a similar posture is that both China and India want to have multiple laws. Uh, India want to have a big boss. In Asia, as also in the world, platform. China has shared the same. So this is the basis. For China. Not only we, I, we want to mention war, because we have more economic cooperation, new more economic views, uh, I know, with CDS and all. You know. But in the political and security level, we have a lot. For example, I mentioned China and India share they have this intention to use uh, uh, strategic security dialogue. This is strategic security dialogue. We need to understand each other over the Indian Ocean, with the Malacca, South China Sea. All these things we share because our national interests. I will merge or we uh, share that in this around these ceilings. So how we build trust, understand Chinese intention and our Indian intention in South China Sea, Chinese intention in Southeast in Indian Ocean. So we, we need more. Uh, I think this uh, uh, we have more I think bilaterally. On the international level, I think the ASEAN can play the important role uh, between China and India. I don't want to, I don't, I don't see the time, so I want to talk about China and Japan. You know, with, this uh, with regard to the question about China and Japan, uh, this was over the area islands, and also how we think about the international law. And, uh, from my point of view, I'm not a professor of international law, actually. I'm a professor of international relations. So, uh, but from my understanding, as I mentioned, China had to take the policy of no first of, you know, provocative action. China never do this first, I think, the similar to work as, as, as Japan and Philippines against China and to against India. I think China do not do the stupid you know, policies towards India uh, to make the, the China Indian border disputes to be a big crisis. China has no intention. So that's why I think uh, if I look at the, the present situation for China and Japan, uh, we saw any uh, policy, uh, policy alternative. I think it should be under the history, under the, uh, the, 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 the international framework after World War II. Uh, we understand China is uh, uh, we, we China was the half colonized country before the 1949. So when China, that's why India, I think, we either understand China relation, we may have a dispute with uh, with India. Uh, with, uh, sorry, with, uh, with Japan, because China uh, lost so many lives in the last uh, you know, 100 years before the 1949. China has had the, the idea of the, how the sovereignty is so important for our rights and powers. This is India, I would say, shared the same. So I think uh, for China and Japan uh, relations in the future, uh, the Japan should be understand more about Chinese history uh, and share views with China, that means China to have a more stable. Otherwise, there will be more crisis. Uh, bro, uh, this one extension of the first question. The question is, how could China and India work together to, to shape the new international legal order to prevent conflicts from rising such and such as? Well, uh, I will uh, confine my comments to the South China Sea. The United Nations is virtually useless and the suggestion of any action through the United Nations would not be appropriate simply because of the fact that China is a member of the Security Council, has a right of veto, and any effort on the part of the United Nations would be stymied by the exercise of a veto by China. 
if the solution is something which does not cause uh, conflict to China. The second solution, of course, is whether it can be solved through uh, arbitration or through submission of the dispute to the International Court of Justice. I think that is the way that uh, Singapore solved its problems with, uh, with uh, Malaysia and Malaysia solved its problems with Indonesia. But here again, it's very unlikely that China would seek uh, to have this dispute resolved through litigation before the International Court of Justice. The third idea, of course, is that uh, there should be common development of the resources. If the conflict is a resource-based conflict, the long-term time assumption is that somehow there is going to be a lot of oil around the South China Sea and the dispute is about the oil. But that does not appear to be so. So the notion of uh, joint development by the different uh, disputants in the South China Sea area is not also a feasible idea, despite the fact that it is an idea that uh, uh, that many in Singapore have put forward as a solution. The, the outside interest, of course, uh, our outside intervention is presented by, uh, by China, particularly the presence of uh, the United States uh, in, uh, in uh, the discussion of South China Sea. The United States' interest can only be in relation to the freedom of uh, transit, through the South China Sea, and of course, as long as this is guaranteed, neither China nor uh, India should uh, have uh, concern with the South China Sea, at least as far as international law is concerned, because that would seem to be the only interest that is feasible in terms of international law to third parties to the area, that they must have a freedom of transit. The uh, problem is complicated, of course, by assertions of sovereignty. In the sense, as uh, my colleague pointed out, uh, China fervently believes that uh, the nine dotted lines uh, which enclose much of the South China Seas are based upon uh, entirely legal principles. And the funny thing, of course, is that uh, China draws these legal principles entirely upon the basis of an international law that is constructed by Europe in, on the basis of discovery by Admiral Cheng Ho and then down through history, the idea that Chinese fishermen and others have used these islands from historical times. So when, here we find sort of an interesting reversion on the part of China to uh, the Eurocentric international law that I uh, pointed out earlier. The problem, I think, is going to remain with us for a long period see ASEAN uh, uh, a certain discord arising within ASEAN on uh, this subject. But as China rises in power, the uh, bigger the Chinese assertion of uh, its claims to South China Sea can be expected to increase. As to whether there would be any legal solutions to it, as I said, the legal solutions that seem to exist don't provide too much of an avenue. Yes, the gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Anisha. Um, on the question for the uh, first speaker, based on international law, will you be able to share some legal perspectives over the current uh, Sino-Indian uh, border dispute? And as for the second speaker, uh, there has been some understanding between China and India over cooperation in the area of energy. But uh, despite that, there have been some cases of Chinese companies undertaking Indian companies, especially in oil exploration in Africa. And on the political front, China has yet to concretely put its weight behind India's desire for a permanent seat in the UN Security Council. So my question to you is, under what context can there be real truthful cooperation 
between China and India. Thank you. Uh, this question was the biggest question ever. Can you pass? Yeah, we can. from the LKY School at the uh, US. So a question on, uh, on Asian security and the possibility of India-China cooperation in a larger regional organization for some time in the future. And I draw my question from the observation that India and China are the only two countries that are members of several sub-regional organizations in one form or the other, and therefore form the core of a possible Asian security system. Uh, so India and China meet uh, with Russia in that trilateral. Uh, they meet in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, where India is an observer member. China, of course, is a, is a full and leading member there. Uh, India, in a sense, uh, repays the favor uh, with China as an observer member in the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, where, of course, India is a, is a leading member. Uh, they're both part of the ASEAN++ plus plus institutions, ARF, ADMM++, plus plus and, and so on. Uh, they're also both members of the East Asian Summit. Um, possibly in the future, as China's move towards the Indian Ocean almost inevitably occurs, uh, there may be the question of Chinese membership in some fashion or the other in Indian Ocean uh, regional cooperation as well. So you have two of the giants, uh, as it happens, increasingly members in all these organizations, and they're the only two that have that. Uh, do you, as both speakers, do you think there's some possibility or even desirability to use this as the basis for a larger Asian architecture uh, with India and China, uh, and, and of course the United States, because whether anybody likes it or not, the United States is a, an Asian power. Uh, whether India and China should and could form the basis of a larger regional organization and take the lead there, would that be a good thing?
So uh, I think this is also the topic uh, in this other framework. Countries, China, India, secret it out. If we, if we have the data built, this is, uh, I think it uh, depends on our diplomatic design, diplomatic design process. I think that's okay. Well, can I end here? Because when you just now get the fifties, both China and India have really played a very big more influence on the world through the financial spirit and the financial spirit. Could this be why um, things have changed so much that today these two budget powers can play the same role? Yeah, uh, I would very much think that it could be done. The Chinese uh, always talk about harmony under their heavens. That's a prelude to all the statements that they make. And I, I believe that that comes from uh, historical and cultural ideas for the Chinese people. And there is a resonance of that uh, on the Indian side as well. The uh, Bandung Conference and Peaceful Coexistence. In fact, there is a treaty in 1952 between China and India relating to how they should, be, should, should conduct their affairs in uh, Tibet relating to the idea of peaceful coexistence, specifying all the principles of coexistence uh, in uh, a legal manner. So there is a possibility of a development of this, and you would find it articulated best in, I think, the New Delhi Declaration of BRICS, where there is a lot of statements relating to the need for cooperation. And BRICS, I feel, is driven by China and India to a large extent. There will be other areas of cooperation besides the one which uh, can't be mentioned. There's uh, the hope that there will be a new free trade agreement made between uh, ASEAN, China and India that would uh, have an area and a population that is far in excess of the Trans-Pacific uh, Treaty that the United States uh, has proposed. So this could create a market that is much larger. A short note on the border dispute. I mean, the border dispute is going to be there, but I think its significance would come to be reduced in time to come. And uh, there is uh, not much but air about the border dispute in recent times. So one would hope that it would go away. But uh, the border dispute is probably one area which the lawyer is greatly interested in. Because the Indian argument is very clearly stated and the Chinese state it in the form of an assertion of a doctrine that is uh, enunciated by the Chinese uh, on their own, the notion of an unequal treaty. The idea being that the Macron line between China and India was drawn in historical times when China was not a major power. Thank you, Bob. I'm cautious that we have several questions from the former the last. One of time now, so I think we have to pick the sessions and then uh, we'll continue the session which is focused on the economy and hopefully those uh, questions which are still uh, would like to answer can perhaps delay those questions until that time. And also I'm conscious that both of our excellent speakers have given very comprehensive and stimulating uh, answers to the questions that we have in mind. And on this, I'd like to invite you to show our decision to a two very distinguished speakers. Thank you. Thank you. 